you know, we do our best to create a community that is really amplifying the voices as much as we can of people who are typically not listened to as much as they should be and try to create as safe a space as we're able to. And it has been a real joy and a pleasure to watch people open up about their own real experiences. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Seek the Joy podcast. Happy Seek the Joy Tuesday. I'm your host, Sydney Weiss, and on the podcast this week is Liza Kindred. She's the founder of F This Meditation, which started off as a larger online Instagram community, and it's grown to become just so much more than that. It's also now a book. Liza released her first book in October. It's called F This Meditation, 108 Tips, Tricks, and Ideas for When You're Feeling Anxious, Stressed Out, or Overwhelmed. And I was so excited to have this conversation with Liza. I should also mention she's the founder of Mindful Technology. She's a licensed minister, a level two Reiki practitioner. I mean, there's nothing that Liza doesn't do and she's a total badass and she keeps it 100, as we say. She keeps it totally real, and she's really driven to try and make the world a better place. And so I knew that we would not only connect, but have a really fun and awesome, deep and insightful conversation for the podcast. And so I was so happy to sit down with her. And in this week's new episode, we chat all about Liza's meditation practice and Buddhism studies, the inspiration behind F This Meditation, and the video of the Dalai Lama that that changed everything. We also talk about what it means to embrace true wellness, how we can see ourselves as whole and worthy already, and what it means to remember that you're complete, just not finished. We talk about finding sacredness in every aspect of our lives. Spirituality is really whatever it is that we make it, the myth of meditation, and Liza shares with us her top tips for anyone who's ready and interested in beginning a meditation practice. Plus, Liza shares with us the inspiration behind her new book that started as a spreadsheet, why it's a privilege to show up as who we are, setting boundaries in our digital spaces, how Liza stays energized and engaged, and so much more. This week's new episode is truly epic, if I do say so myself, and it's multi-layered. We go deep, but also keep things really lighthearted, and honestly, from the moment I got on the phone with Liza, I knew it was going to be a great conversation, so I can't wait to hear what you guys think about this one. Make sure to join the conversation on our social media channels. We are at Seek the Joy Podcast everywhere, and if you're listening to us right now on the Apple Podcast app, make sure to hit subscribe, and then scroll down and leave us a rating and review. Ratings and reviews really help independent podcasts like this one get seen by new people and it's a really great way to share what you think about the podcast and also gives people an idea of what to expect when they tune in. So when you leave us that rating and review, take a screenshot and send it to sydney at seekthejoypodcast.com. I will send you our guide for infusing more joy into your life and it's a great way for us to connect outside of the show too. I am seriously so grateful for everything that Liza shared in this week's new episode from sharing about the impact of accepting and loving ourselves as we are to how to make meditation more accessible and taking the sacred and the profane and bringing it all together with joy and love. I know without a doubt there are going to be so many moments that resonate and stay with you too. So let's dive into this one. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Liza Kindred of F This Meditation. When did you start meditating? Let's start there. Yeah. So I started meditating about 12 or 13 years ago and I, I really, I started an at-home practice and I started, uh, because I, I thought it was something I was supposed to do, mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like meditate and ex- or, you know, exercise, eat well, like just a list of things that you're supposed to do to like stay healthy. Uh, and, 
uh, at first it was something that I just did an at home practice. And after doing it at home for a while, I started uh, studying it more in depth and, and became a student of Shambhala Buddhism and started mm-hmm. going in and uh, taking classes and courses and starting to practice with other people as well. So uh, it's been a little while that I've been meditating, a, a little over a decade now, and it has kind of changed and shifted, but always since then been an important part of how I take care of myself. Yeah, I love what you just shared about how you felt like meditating was what you were supposed to do. And I think especially Uh today in this wellness focused culture, we're thrown like so, there's so many things that are coming at us that we feel we have to do meditate, breath work, eat a certain way, celery juice in the morning. (laughs) And I feel surrounded by these pressures like all the time. And I've gone through periods of time where I meditate daily and then months on end when I don't. And I always share and I always say, you know, do what feels good for you in the moment. And if it feels like too much pressure, like let it go. So I think it's interesting that you shared that, like you felt like you had to start meditating, but, but you've been doing it now for like over a decade. And and obviously it's had, you know, a strong impact on your life. Yeah, it has. And I love that you're saying that, uh, about this long list of things that we're supposed to do now, because I, I really look at one of the things that I think is so important for us to see with clear eyes is this idea of, uh, if I can introduce this idea of the wellness industrial complex, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is we have this uh, enormous world of wellness, which is kind of broadly defined, uh, is now a $4 trillion uh, industry, which is enormous. And we have from so many different directions, we have uh, people and companies and ideas that are all perpetuating this idea uh, that we have something inside of us that needs to be fixed or mm-hmm. needs to change. And I call BS on the whole idea. I think that uh, the idea of constant striving, that push towards constant change, is the planned obsolescence of the wellness world. And what I mean by that is in our physical products that we buy, stuff mm-hmm. like our iPhones, those are all designed to fall apart so that we have to keep replacing them. You know, they're designed, the um, materials are designed cheaply, or there's things that happen like the, you know, with the iPhone, the new um, headphone jack. It's like all of a sudden our old headphones or our chargers mm-hmm. and with our, you know, we have to like keep going and keep we going. We keep going and buying new stuff and, and that has to be replaced. Yeah. And it never, ever ends and it never will. And in the wellness world, I feel like the corollary of that is this idea that we must constantly be striving and we must constantly be bettering ourselves. Uh, a lot of times it's really explicit. Be better, be a better person, be a better this. Uh, and in my studies, uh, my decade of studies now of Buddhism, uh, combined with my own personal experience, have really led me to believe in my heart of hearts that we cannot hate ourselves or change ourselves into someone that we love. Mm. We can mm-hmm. only accept ourselves for who we are, who we are right now today. If we learn the skill of loving ourselves the way that we are, then that's a skill that we can take from the present moment and take it going forward into the future. But if we have some idea of, oh, I have to do all these things and change these things and drink this much celery juice mm-hmm. and you know do my breath work and da 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 da, you know, and then and then I'll get to a place or a time when I'm going to feel like enough. That is impossible. That will never happen. It's impossible. And I feel like it sets us up for disappointment for this ongoing struggle with self-love, with compassion, with acceptance of self. And I'd love what you shared that this deep rooted belief and wisdom that you carry with you and that you share comes from this experience with Buddhism, but also your own personal experience. And, and so what has that been like, you know, not only drawing on your own experiences and, and building out your own Um, building out your wisdom, I think, from those experiences, what has that been like to really draw on that and then, you know, share it too through your work, both with the communities that you've created and your new book that's on the horizon. Yeah. What has that been like? Yeah. Thank you. You know, I want to share part of my, my own personal story uh, because I think it kind of helps us out here. So I was, I became pregnant with my daughter out of you know, I wasn't married and I was 20 years old when I got pregnant and I was 21 when I had her. And so 
I was really young. And at the time I was working in a mall and kind of partying and, um, didn't have a ton of direction or focus, um, which is fine. Cause I was young and I was hanging out and that was all good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I had her when I was so, so, so young and I never felt as a mother, I never felt like I knew that much more than my child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I felt like when my daughter was born, she had so much wisdom inside of her already that I just kind of felt like we were a little bit growing up together mm -hmm. uh, and not in the way that I was like, you know, oh, she's my best friend. We hang out all the time. Yeah. But, you know, because I think healthy boundaries are important, Yeah. but, totally. uh, but more kind of the way where I would be like, Hey, I just figured this thing out. Um, now I'll teach you. <laughs> yeah. Because I was still really, you know, when you're 20, or at least for myself, when I was 20, I was still trying to figure out not only how the world worked, but who I wanted to be and how I wanted to be in the world and how I wanted to experience it. And so for me, whenever I would learn something, and it's true to this day, when I find something that resonates deeply with my heart, I turn around and share it. And uh, for many, many years, I was sharing it just with my daughter. And in more recent years, I have had a little bit more courage to share it more broadly. Yeah. And it's a really strong part of my identity that I never have felt like I'm all the way down the road, that I've got stuff figured out and I've mm -hmm. got it sorted. It Really where I'm at is, is, and the place I try to come from is I've learned a thing or two uh, and I'm willing to share. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> mm -hmm. and sometimes it helps people. Uh, you know, sometimes it resonates. Maybe sometimes it doesn't and that's fine because uh, I'm not trying to be the all-encompassing guru and I'm not pretending that I know everything. Uh, but I do want to be able to share, you know, what I figured out in the hopes that it can be a little bit helpful. That's so interesting because I, I find for myself too, you know, we have to walk the walk ourselves first, right? Before we can even yeah. help someone else. And so it's interesting what you shared about that is like, I, I yes. know a thing or two, and I want to share it with you too, but not coming from the space of I know all. And you know, this is how you should be. It's like, no, this is this is what I've learned. And right, it's, it's yeah. an interesting kind of push pull. And it's we're sort of at a crossroads in our culture too of, of figuring that out. Yeah. And it's, and also I have only figured out what works for me yeah. and, and yeah. I'm sharing it from that place. But I, there's this whole thing of, I call it the cult of it worked for me. So it will work for you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is that so many people have said, I have figured out the path. I figured out the diet, the practice, the meditation, the way, you know, whatever yeah. it is, yeah. uh, that this is the answer. You guys like here it is. I found it when really what they found and it's great that they found it, but what they found is something that works for them. Mm -hmm. But it is not something that is necessarily going to work for everyone else or anyone else. And and that really has informed even my book, which I know we're going to talk about, but my book has 108 different practices in mm -hmm. it. And it is fully intended, like I'm putting it out there knowing that not everyone is going to like everything in there. And that's totally fine. I'm just offering up a bunch of options that people could potentially try and maybe find some things that work for them. I don't think, you know, we all have our own unique bodies and spirits and histories and life experiences and environments that we're living in. And, yeah. and I don't think there is anyone, anything, you know, that works for everybody. Uh, but I think that we can still share what works for us as long as we're doing it in a place that's not like from on high, totally. like you were talking about. Yeah. And I agree with that too. And I think, you know, we don't even know sometimes what's going to work best for us until we kind of dip our toe in different waters and test things out and, and, you know, see if it resonates and see if it doesn't. And uh -huh. I, I always have to remind myself too, you know, just because I started one thing and it resonated for a moment, you know, doesn't mean it has to be my forever thing. Yeah. You know, we are constantly growing and shifting and changing. And that means, you know, not only being gentle with ourselves, you know, through that, but also being willing to let go of maybe the thing that worked before and, and yeah. being open to trying something new. Absolutely. Yeah. And it makes sense when we have attachments to things mm -hmm. that are working. But yeah, I think you're absolutely right. If we're able to have that spaciousness and that openness to trying new things and to letting things go, then we can have a lot more richness, I think, in our lives. Yeah, I think so too. And what's so interesting about 
our journeys, our experiences always inform, you know, our journeys and what we create and what we build. And, and you've built this community called F this meditation. I, <laughs> I love that because I think sometimes what's missing from these spaces is like the realness and like cussing and being who you are. And, <laughs> and I've really tried on this show, like not to swear a lot, because I think if families are listening to this show or like, you know, parents with their kids, right. you know, you want to keep it PG, but like in my real like day to day life, like sometimes I, I, you know, I cuss like a sailor and my parents are probably <laughs> listening to this right now and being like, that is the truth. But what kind of like informed, like, yeah, what, yeah, yeah what? Like, what the heck? Yeah, like, what, <laughs> what motivated you to start F This Meditation? Where did it start? I mean, obviously, it's now, you know, also the name of your book. So where, right. where did this community really begin? It is, I think it's unlike most other things. Yeah. And- You know, when I put it out there, I didn't know if it was going to resonate with anyone else. But really, the you you kind of tapped into it there, uh, talking about uh, there's not a lot of levity in the space Mm -hmm. in the in meditation, especially. I see when I look at the kind of wellness world and specifically the meditation world, I see a lot of preciousness. Uh, I see a lot of kind of soft focused lenses and bliss and uh, thin white blonde women doing amazing yoga poses Mm -hmm. and uh, people meditating with looks of bliss on their face, (laughs) like stock photo kind of stuff. Yeah. Very Uh, Zen, very at peace, very calm. (laughs) Uh, Very, in my experience, fake. Yeah. Uh, You know, after having uh, been doing this for a little while, uh, and again, I'm only speaking about my experience and, and I think, you know, talking broadly about what people have shared with me. Yeah. The meditation experience is gritty and raw, and it can be very difficult. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it has moments; it can have those moments of of bliss. I've certainly had them, uh, and I hope to have more. Yeah. Uh, but it's not my experience; hasn't been like that. And so, I did uh, a few years ago. I completed my meditation teacher training, and my fellow uh, teacher trainees all were had these really cool ideas about how to make meditation more accessible. So uh, someone was wanting to take it to uh, women who had just experienced recent trauma and someone else was taking it to an elementary school and someone was taking it to prison. And those are all fantastic, amazing things that people are doing uh, to make it more accessible. And I thought a lot about that and I was trying to think about how can I make meditation more accessible, but do it in a way that is true and resonant to who I am. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because although those things, I find them really inspiring, none of those were the things that I was really feeling drawn to. And so I decided, it all started with this Instagram account where I decided I'm going to start this Instagram account about meditation and and see what happens with it. And I I personally have a lot of times felt in, in life, like I want to throw my hands up in the air and just yell like (laughs) F this. Mm-hmm, totally. <laughs> and, More times a day than I can count. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and I am not going to pretend like that doesn't happen. And so I was like, I'm going to create a safe space for people who have really kind of gritty experiences. And I was inspired by, I know this is going to sound really funny, but my favorite teachers have always been the ones that have humor and levity and Mm -hmm. uh, modern references in their work. Uh, And I find that talking about things in that way for me makes it more accessible. And, And there's this video of the Dalai Lama. And I'm sorry to to denigrate your podcast this way by saying this oh, word, but good. he Do it. is talking about his farts. I love it. <laughs> I was not expecting that, but that is hysterical. Okay. He is, he, he is on stage and there's a whole bunch of people that are waiting for him to say something really and profound, profound yeah. Yeah, and amazing. <laughs> and he is cracking himself up talking about farting on an airplane. That's amazing. <laughs> I, I got to find that video. Yes. Yes. Find it. You can link to it. It is so funny. And I've watched it so many times. And part of what I, I mean, I just love that because it is taking something and this is the tagline that has developed about the FS meditation community, taking the, the sacred and the profane and meeting them with that same kind of joy mm-hmm, and love. Mm-hmm. And so it really is FS meditation is really about 
allowing room for all the different parts of spirituality to exist in one place where we're bringing all the whole parts of who we are, you know, the swearing like a sailor and the throwing your hands in the air and, (laughs) and like getting annoyed sometimes and taking it out on people sometimes. And like all of this is part of the amazing experience of life and no one is perfect. It's just that some people pretend they are on Instagram. It's interesting what you just said, that it's really about bringing all of the parts of spirituality together. Because I think often when we think about spirituality, we think about always showing up as the best version of who we are, right? We think about showing up, you know, like perfect and contained and Mm -hmm. blissful. And the truth is, is spirituality, at least for me, is whatever you make it in that moment and whatever allows you to in my view, at least, really connect to the core of who you are. So if at the core of who you are is like someone who is not always contained and perfect and is normal and real and human and has moments of doubt and failure, but also moments of success and joy, like that is spirituality to me. And and so I think it's interesting. Mm -hmm. And I love that you share that it's really about bringing all these pieces together. Yeah, everything and not allowing, you know, this version of this definition of spirituality to to be the kind of all or nothing. Yes, absolutely. You know, another tagline we use sometimes is you can sit with us. I love it. <laughs> Taking it from me, girl. I'm joke. here for it. Yeah. <laughs> but you can literally sit with us and yeah. like sit down yeah. and meditate and come Don't as sit. you are. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. And that's the kind of thing I mean, where it's like, there's just so many things that are happening. There is so much sacredness in the world around us. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be, you know, this kind of soft focus, whitewash sacredness. Mm -hmm. There is just so much that is out there that we can find connection and beauty in. And, you know, it can be farts. I love it. It can be. <laughs> because I think anything can be sacred, but it's about what you make of it. Yeah. How you, how you approach it, how you allow it to come into your life, how you greet it, how you work with it, how you let it move through you. I mean, that's the practice, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Through your community. I mean, I know you have these beliefs and things that you share. And, and one of them is what you shared at the beginning of our conversation, which, which is that there's nothing to be fixed, that you're not broken. But another belief that you share is that we're complete as we are. We're just not yeah. finished. I'd love mm-hmm. to know, you know, what does that mean to you? And and I think it's almost, it can be, you know, viewed as a mantra. Uh, what role has that yes. kind of played in your life? Knowing you're complete, but you're just, you're not finished yet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. This, the, it is almost like a mantra for me. You are complete, just not finished. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's funny because someone had said it to me and later on when I tried to give him credit for it, he said, I don't remember ever saying that. So oh, I can't I actually it. attribute it to anyone, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it has been a thread in my life, this idea. You know, so many times when I have talked about you are whole, you are perfect, uh, you have everything you need. I have people that say to me, yes, I agree, but also I have goals and ambition and aspiration. And uh, I'm scared, really, that if I accept the idea that I'm fine, that everything is fine, that I will lose that drive. Mm -hmm. And I get it. I really, really get it. But I don't think those two things work that way. Mm -hmm. I think that we can be in touch with our wholeness, our completeness, that everything about us is valid, that we have all the wisdom we ever need inside of our bodies, that it is all here. We can accept that idea that we are complete and whole and worthy. And we can also live the idea that we're not finished, that we still have things we want to do and things we want to try and things we want to accomplish. I believe that those two things, when they're in concert, can actually give us what so many of us are looking for, which is that feeling of loving ourselves, Mm -hmm. but we're still maintaining that uh, ability to keep working towards the things that we want to be able to do. I agree with that too. I think, you know, remembering that you are complete as you are, it allows you to step even further into that sense of worthiness and even further into that sense of self-love. And I think it ties back to what you mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, which is just that, you know, if you look at your iPhone, it's continuing to evolve and change and (laughs) you need to get a new, you know, um, set of headphones and now you need air pods and you can't plug anything Mm -hmm. into it anymore, you know, at all. 
I think it goes in, it's the same concept here of like, you're just evolving. You're learning more about yourself. You're growing and you're changing, but who you are, you know, at your core is already complete and already worthy. The wellness world as an industry can't really promote that idea because if we kind of accept that we're whole and worthy, so much of the things that are being sold to us would go away. Mm -hmm. And that idea that we have to constantly be more, 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 the thing is, there's no end to that. There's not a chapter at the end of that book that's like, you have any of those books that are like, and here's how to just be happy now that you've achieved that amount of goals. Yeah, yeah. It is an endless cycle of having to do and be and change more. But the way that we can rebel against that and embrace true wellness mm-hmm. and, and holistic wholeness is to just love ourselves and see ourselves as whole and worthy already without the outside yeah. stuff. I think that's a good point too, is seeing yourself that way already. And I, I kind of try and apply that um, to every aspect of my life, like already seeing myself in the arenas that I want to be in, already seeing myself as being worthy of anything that it is that I'm searching for, knowing that I'm complete as I am, you know, that I already have the tools within me, the self-love, the growth, whatever it might be. The more that I remind myself of that, the easier it is to step fully into it too. Did you find that for yourself as well as you've kind of embarked on, you know, because I would imagine you've been on a self-love journey and a wellness journey of your own, you know, really arriving, you know, at that space. Yeah. I don't think I've arrived. I don't think there is Mm -hmm. any uh, arrival. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, you know, one of the things I say a lot is there is no there. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> you know, again, we don't like get to a place, but man, yeah, you are so right. I'm on that journey. I'm on that journey every single day of trying to love myself as best that I can. Uh, it, and there's going back to what we were talking about earlier, there are certain things that are more effective at different times and letting me, uh, connect to that part of myself. And other times I need different strategies uh, but over time, and, and it seems like this is what you're saying too. There's a, there's like a kindness to yeah, myself, yeah. like almost a friendliness that kind of parks and is usually there hanging out in the back of the room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like maybe not in the front row, uh, but is there in the room, this idea that, uh, you know, m- one of my very favorite concepts in Buddhism is this idea of the second arrow mm-hmm. and, the second arrow is, is, it's pretty simple. It's basically if, uh, if we're shot by an arrow and we're hurting, uh, why would we shoot another arrow at ourselves Mm -hmm. and hurt more? Which is to say, if we're having pain or sadness or struggles of any kind, uh, so often we beat ourselves up for having those struggles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the second arrow. And that's something that you know, no one is immune to, I I do it myself. I'll wake up in the middle of the night and start stressing it. I think to myself, you've written a book about this. You should know better, you know? And Mm -hmm. then I'm like, well, maybe I didn't know better than to stress, but I know better than to listen to that main voice, you know? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, it still happens, but, uh, but I'm able to like meet it, identify it and be like, I'm not going to shoot that second arrow at myself. You know, it's okay that I'm stressed. I have a lot going on. No big deal. Yeah. (laughs) All right, guys, taking a brief break from this week's new episode to talk to you about something I'm really excited about and I'm really loving, which is our Seek the Joy Guide to Podcasting and our Seek the Joy Guide to Pitching Guests. I have been so overwhelmed and blown away by not only the response to both guides, but what you guys have already shared with me about the impact that they're having on your podcasting journey and my whole mission and focus with both guides is to really help you get your message off the ground and into the ears of the people that really need to hear it the most. And so I am just so excited to finally launch and share both of these guides and to see them in action as you begin to develop and grow and launch a podcast of your dreams. So head on over to seekthejoypodcast.com slash seekthejoyguides to check them out or hit that link in the show notes. It'll take you right there. And I'm excited to see where you go with this podcasting journey. All right, guys, without further ado, let's head back to this week's new episode. Yeah, it sounds like you've had to learn for yourself how to interrupt that voice, how to interrupt that negative self-talk, to return to that space of 
what I, I really kind of think must be this radical, almost compassion for self and kindness that we are not mm. always brought up in, that we're not always taught. And you, you kind of have to teach it to yourself and be able to interrupt yourself in those moments and say, all right, like, I'm not gonna listen to that voice. I'm going to choose that kindness that you mentioned, you know, is in the room and probably right. should be in the driver's seat or at least in the passenger <laughs> seat of the car, but at least it's in the room right now. And and so have you had to really teach yourself how to do that and, and interrupt those oh thoughts gosh, you know, as yes. they come? Yeah. And that's where for me, meditation has been a really helpful tool. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty uh, universal experience that when we first start meditating, one of the first things that we notice often is just how busy our minds are. Oh like God. how much we're thinking, which is why those <laughs> photos of people meditating like are so crazy right. making because you look so calm. But like, I don't know about you, but anytime I've sat down to meditate, like it's like, oh, what should I have for lunch today? Like, oh, wait, did I do that? E- like, did I write that email right yesterday? Like all the stupid minutia like, like comes to the surface. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then you're like, wait, hold on. But it's really what I've learned. And, and, and maybe this is your experience, too. It's like it's not about fully quieting the mind. It's more about learning to sit with whatever shows up and and not judge it and not focus too intently on it too and and kind of like learn to slow down a little bit in yeah, those moments. Absolutely. Yeah. And you you got it. You got it exactly because and there's this myth of meditation and there's a lot of untrained meditation teachers or inexperienced meditation teachers. You know, meditation in yoga there's the yoga alliance that at least requires a minimum amount of training for mm-hmm. teaching. There's nothing like that in meditation. Oh, there wow. are a lot of people teaching I have meditation. No idea. But as with anything mm-hmm. else, uh, if we want to teach something to people, it's important for us to learn the way to teach mm-hmm. something. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of people that are coming from a place of, of passion, but maybe not necessarily experience. And and so for that reason, I think that there is a super common myth that meditation is about finding quiet mm-hmm. or finding peace. And I know meditators that have meditated, like done retreats for months or years. And there are definitely, again, there's those moments of quiet, uh, but that's not where, that's not where people end up. And that's not the goal of a meditation practice in our daily life. When you're talking about, Oh, what am I, what were you saying? What am I having for lunch? And like Mm -hmm, this and mm -hmm. that, the moment that you notice, Oh, I'm thinking, you know, I'm supposed to be meditating and I'm thinking that moment right there, that's the moment of mindfulness. Mm. Like that's the way that the meditation works. A lot of people think that they have to, uh, it's when they clear their mind of thoughts completely. And it's just, it's like, well, that, that's just not going to happen. That's not the goal. It shouldn't be the goal. Uh, that's a myth. Mm -hmm. But what can happen is that we notice, oh, I'm thinking we can notice that with kindness and we can just bring our attention back to the thing that we were trying to focus on, which a lot of times is the breath and just with kindness, bring it back and bring it back. And that noticing and choosing where to place your focused attention, that's exercising the muscle of meditation. So that's the moment right there of, oh, I'm thinking, let me go back to the meditation. That's the Mm, practice. That makes makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. If someone sits and does that like one time, if they sat for 20 minutes and they thought for 19 minutes and after 19 minutes, they were like, oops, I'm supposed to be meditating. Uh, They meditated. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I love this. So if someone is listening to this and whether they've meditated a hundred times or five times or have never meditated before and they really want to, but they feel maybe intimidated or stuck or, you know, they resonate with what we've shared, which is that they sit there and they feel like they can't sit still or their mind is racing. What would be your top tip or is there a good place to start with a number of minutes to have your eyes closed? You know, what would you share with someone who who wants to start meditating and experiencing this practice, but, you know, maybe doesn't even know where where to begin? Yeah, I I think that having... Doing guided meditation when you're starting out can be a really good thing to do. You know, there's there's a lot of different apps. Uh, we have a YouTube channel that has various meditations on it. Letting someone give you some instruction when you're first starting out can be a really good thing. Mm-hmm. But really, whatever the experience is, if we're able to greet that with a kind of curiosity, uh, it's not about having a specific kind of experience, but more about just noticing what the experience was like. Mm-hmm. Uh Hopefully that can give a little bit of ease. It can be a minute. I mean, it can really be one minute. Uh, In F This Meditation, the book, 
Uh, it has 108 practices in it, but fully half of them take five minutes or less. Wow. There's a lot that we can do in like 60 seconds yeah. uh, with focused attention. And so if someone is really struggling with it, doing a minute a day, and then maybe working up when you feel like it to two minutes a day, five, 10, that is fine. Doing a minute of meditation is awesome and is so much better than doing none. And you also mentioned the eyes closed thing. If someone is really tired and is struggling with having their eyes closed, it's okay to have them softly open. Mm -hmm. uh, and if someone is feeling really agitated, like they really can't sit, that's okay too. You can do a walking meditation. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different ways that we can approach it. It's really about being gentle with yourself uh, and finding what works and hopefully working with someone, getting some instruction from someone that has some experience. Yeah. Meditation is not this one image that we have. It can really be anything. And I think, you know, even just a moment of being mindful can serve as meditation. Yeah, absolutely. It can really be a part of our daily lives. And who knows, even when we're seeing these, yeah, you know, these pictures of people sitting in full lotus on their meditation cushion on the beach, who knows what's actually going on in their minds? Maybe they're I thinking mean, about lunch. They probably are. <laughs> I wouldn't blame them. And so can we talk a little bit about your book? And we, we, we've referenced it a couple of times and yeah. the different practices that are in it. But did you always want to be an author? Like, did you set out to write a book or did this just kind of organically, yeah. you know, come your way? Yeah. So it actually started out, uh, as a spreadsheet, which I know you'll appreciate. Yes. Oh, I love it. <laughs> so I, so I mentioned my daughter earlier. And so my daughter was, uh, about a year and a half ago, she was getting ready to graduate from high school mm. and she had decided to take a gap year where she was going to travel around the world. And I started having this kind of mommy panic mm -hmm. where I realized that I had learned stuff I hadn't taught her. And, you know, like we were talking about earlier. And so I started this spreadsheet for her where I'm like, okay, if you're feeling anxious, here's a column you know, of practices you can do if you're feeling overwhelmed or sad or lonely. And then I'm like, I did, you know, the other way it's like, okay, one minute, five minutes. Yeah. I just, it's like, you know, okay, you're at the airport. Here's something you can try. Uh, anyway, so it started as that. I, I actually decided, uh, that I wanted to turn it into a book for her and give it to her for graduation. So I worked oh. with this awesome designer who helped me and we went to a website online and we had this kind of version one printed out and it was beautiful. She did a wonderful job. And that, that was my graduation gift to my daughter was this book hmm. uh, of like, if you can't take mommy with you in your backpack. This is so sweet. <laughs> I love it. Oh. Like here's the book. So uh, yeah, so I had finished the book and then I had one of those awesome serendipitous moments where a publisher slid into my DMs oh on the Epis Meditation Instagram account and she was like, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I was like, I have a book. <laughs> you're like, I, actually, I'm ready to go. So like your timing I, is perfect. Yeah. It was so great. She told me uh, that I was the first, uh, the first author that they'd had that had come in for the first meeting with a book in my hand, a completed wow. book in my wow. hand. Wow. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, and they helped me edit it down. And uh, the book is so, I'm so proud of it. It's so beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's, uh, it really fits the kind of cheeky aesthetic of mm -hmm. our, uh, Instagram community. Uh, it's like pink and purple and it's full color on the inside. And it's, so it's 108 of these tips and wow. they're organized several different ways. Um, I mean, to be completely honest with you, I did one this morning with my daughter. I was FaceTiming her and she was feeling uh, some strong emotions. And so I said to her, just pick a number. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she picked a number and I said, okay, I got a book for us. Oh my God, I love <laughs> I it. I pulled out my copy and we did the, uh, it was practice number eight is what it was. And practice number eight is the, it's a one minute practice. It was a hand over the heart practice. So we put our hands over our our hearts, uh, closed our eyes and took 10 deep breaths mm. together, just mm -hmm. kind of noticing what our heart space felt like. And that was it. That was the practice. Wow. This is a beautiful story. And I just love how it came from this real space of wanting to be there for your daughter. You know, it's like, if I can't be with the person physically, then here's a piece of me and what I've learned. And it comes back to, I think who you are and what you shared at the beginning, which is 
you know, knowing what has worked for you and embarking on your own personal journey and experiences and, and bringing it together and sharing it. And what I love so much about your book and what you've created is that there are so many tools and so many practices and you can really pick and choose. And I love this practice of like, okay, pick a number and then kind of just <laughs> flipping through and picking something. The first one she chose was a 90 minute practice. So oh, she was sorry, like, let's that's pick not another work. number. <laughs> it, so does it really range from like something that's like 30 seconds to 90 minutes? Do you have everything in between, um, you know, for people to choose from? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is really, really broad and you know, some of them can be shortened or lengthened depending on what you like, but the book is really intended to be like, just try some of these things. Uh, forget the ones that don't really feel like they're the right fit, but yeah. bookmark the ones that do. Yeah. You know, I mean, it can be just a series of a couple of it, breaths that are done intentionally. Yeah. And so it can be just a few seconds long. Although the longer ones are really powerful and can really affect a lot of change. But the book is really meant to be, you know what, practical, like mm-hmm. realistic. Mm-hmm. Meant to be used. Yeah. Having just these like moments of mindfulness can really, especially if we do them frequently throughout the day, can really change the tenor of the whole day. Uh, but, you know, like I said, we, we have to do them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the key, right? Yeah. It sounds like, too, that this entire journey of writing the book and creating the book and, and the same with the F this meditation community. I mean, it sounds like it's been a lot of fun and it's brought you a lot of joy. What have you gained or learned the most from, you know, putting your book out into the world? I know it's coming out at the end or the middle of October and it'll be available by the time this episode airs. I'm so excited, but like, yeah, what have you really learned or gained it? And what has this experience really been like for you? It has been so beautiful. I was thinking about this yesterday about how as the community has grown and I have been so blessed to have so many interactions with such a wide variety of people uh, online and then and then some of them in person. Mm-hmm. And I have just felt so grateful that I have put myself out there in a genuine and real way. Mm -hmm. And so many people have met it and reflected it back with such just their own joy and their own lived experiences. I love having conversations with people. It is such a respectful community. People disagree a lot, (laughs) Uh, but it's all done in kindness and it's all fine because it's, we're all just sharing what our lived experience is is like. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we do our best to create a community that is really amplifying the voices as much as we can of people who are typically not listened to uh, as much as they should be and try to create as safe a space as we're able to. And it has been a real joy and a pleasure to watch people open up about their own real experiences. Mm -hmm. Uh, People who are longtime meditators, people who have never tried it, and even meditation teachers that kind of roll on up and start telling their own stories about, you know, mistakes Mm -hmm. that they made or things that they're laughing about, about themselves. And it has just been such a, a a true genuine pleasure. And I have so much gratitude for people for showing up in that way. I love that. And I think that's so beautiful. And, you know, people start to show up more fully and authentically and, and really who they are, I think, when we do the same. And so what I've loved too so much about this podcast and these conversations is I found the more open and honest I am about my own journey. And, you know, there are moments, yes, where being more vulnerable is really scary. And I'm thinking, yeah. what the hell are you doing? Why are you doing this? <laughs> but then when I do it and then I get that email or that DM or that comment that says, hey, I really resonated with what you shared, here's my experience. It's healing, you know, it's healing for you yeah. and it's also healing for, for them. And I think that's really how we continue to create these spaces and these conversations is by really showing up and being respectful and compassionate and honest and, and vulnerable and really watching it, you know, all unfold. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's, it, it is not easy. Like you're saying, it's not always easy to just be like, you know, here I am. Like, this is me. <laughs> Here you yeah. go. <laughs> but you know, it, it, even, even that itself is such a genuine opportunity. I was actually writing about this the other day. We have this idea in the, uh, in, in our kind of wellness spiritual space of like, just be you. Mm-hmm. And it is truly a privilege. Like there mm-hmm. are people who 
will never, well, I hope this is wrong, but who for so many years have not been able to show up who they are. Mm -hmm. You know, we have people whose skin color or sexual identity or whatever makes them targets out in the world and they can't like just be themselves. Uh, they have to protect themselves and, and keep themselves safe. And so I think the the onus is really on those of us who are able to show up with that vulnerability yeah. to create safe spaces and uh, to really know how much of a privilege it is and to treat it as such. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point too. And I think it's something that so many of us and myself included, you know, take for granted. And I think recognizing that there needs to be more inclusivity in these spaces and more honesty about what a privilege that actually is. And I think yeah. the more we can have conversations like that and begin to really open the door to getting more comfortable with saying, hey, you know, there is a lot of discrepancy in wellness. And yes, there's a lot of information, but there's also a real sense of privilege still. And oh, yeah. there isn't, oh, yeah. you know, full accessibility to, to practices and to knowledge and to understanding. And so the more that we make these tools, you know, inclusive and accessible, the more we can grow these spaces too. And so your book is doing that. It's, it's part I of that, so. Thank that you. journey and that messaging. And, and F this meditation too, just keeping it really real. And profane <laughs> and sacred All and everything else in between. All yeah, welcome. Except for the mean people who judge us. I block people on that Instagram account. Really? If they Do get you me. get a lot of that? Do you get like a lot I of judgment and nastiness in your DMs? Yeah. I wouldn't say a lot, but I definitely get it's always older white dudes oh, who are telling gosh. me that I'm living the Dharma wrong. That, oh, <laughs> that no, like, really? But it's fine because I just block them. You know, I just like report and block them because uh, I have set such an intention about who I want to have feel welcome, mm -hmm. you know, in my digital space. And I do not always do it right, mm -hmm. but I'm always trying. And I'm so grateful when I get feedback about ways to do it better. Uh, I genuinely, I love it when people call me in on stuff Yeah, because I feel like that itself is, is someone really trusting me, but yeah, really, I'm like holding my arms out really wide right now. I'm like, come here, all you people who like meditated and, uh, felt like you were too, you know, like anxious ridden or, you know, you mm -hmm, like meditated mm -hmm. and then you got up and yelled at your kids. Like you all come here. <laughs> you're welcome here. Yeah. Like, you're welcome in this yeah. space. We're all just figuring it out together. <laughs> yeah. I, I have embraced the mute button and the block button more than I ever thought I would in my whole uh, life. You too, huh? Because not that I get nastiness, but I do get sometimes if it, if it serves as a trigger for me, if it makes me more anxious, if I find, you know, my, I, I, if it's just not good for my soul, I, I will mute you <laughs> or I will block you. I've had some yes. people who have said some not so nice things and, um, you know, I, I do my best to meet it with kindness and with grace, but I don't have to expose myself to it is kind of like the mantra. Yeah. And that brings up a lot of feelings too of like, am I judging that person? But no, you've got to protect yourself and protect your own self-love and your own kindness yeah and if someone is or something is infringing on that it's like eh, no place here like yeah and on. you can wish them well I 100%. mean I that's a practice for me when I you know unfollow or block or mute someone I say I wish you well yeah. like I genuinely you know I want good things for you but yeah. it's not going to be in my feed yeah when, oh my god yeah don't need to this is my digital that. home this is my digital home and this is my digital community and i think yeah, you're not welcome here yeah and i think sometimes it's an unpopular opinion to to do those things but you've got to put yourself first at the end of the day yeah absolutely yeah we have to we have to do what what feels exactly what you're saying it it, it doesn't matter what someone intended we're not trying to tease out intent we're just looking at impact mm -hmm. and if it impacts us in a way that doesn't feel good that's all you need. You don't yeah. have to beat yourself up about it. You don't have to second guess it. You can just block them. <laughs> Amen to that. I've got to ask you um, the question that I ask everyone that comes on Seek the Joy podcast because you know, you've know you built so much and you've done so much and you're still building and you're still creating. But what would you say is your biggest dream? Yeah, I knew that question was coming. You know, I was really thinking about this and I think it's more like my biggest hope. Uh, if you don't mind me going a little sideways, no, please, yes. which is my biggest hope is that I'm able to live my life in a way that can be of benefit to others. Mm. 
That's beautiful. You know, and almost initially I was thinking, well, I want world peace and I want, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> and all these like really great things, um, which are wonderful dreams. And I hope that we do work towards them. But uh, the hope that I hold dear in my heart and that I work with every day that really drives me and that I think about anytime I'm beginning my work is really I hope this is a benefit to mm-hmm. someone. Mm hmm. And I, I find, too, that those hopes and those dreams and those intentions, uh, when we connect ourselves with them and we allow them to, you know, to fill us up and motivate and drive, you know, who we are and what we're doing, it inches us closer to that impact and it inches us closer to you know, what it is that we really want to share and, and the yeah. growth and the change and the feelings of community and inclusiveness or whatever it might be. I mean, it, it really allows it to show up more, uh, when we really lead with those hopes and, and with those intentions. Yeah. And I find also that it can help me to stay energized mm-hmm. because I'm connected to the core of what I'm trying to do. Mm-hmm. That's an important point too, because I, I, I wanted to ask you this, you know, how do you stay energized and focused and motivated? Um, you know, especially when you do so much and so much of who you are and what you do is, is so outward and, and, you know, forward facing as well. Yeah. I spend a lot of time alone. <laughs> oh man, I, I really do. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> It's something that I've had to really lean into for myself uh, that I need a lot of solitary time. You know, I'm a mom, but my daughter is older. She's out. She lives at college now. Uh, And so, you know, I don't have small children at home. And my husband has been very supportive in giving me the space that I need. He doesn't need it for himself and he doesn't necessarily understand it, but he loves me and supports me. Mm -hmm. And I feel very lucky for that. Yeah. Uh, But I do spend a lot of time just quietly on my own, eating healthy food and meditating and listening to music that makes me feel good and doing crossword puzzles, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which I love, uh, but really slowing down and letting myself take these moments to just be. Mm-hmm. And I need that as uh, an antidote to Mm -hmm. all the doing. Yeah, because we can get so stuck in the doing and the feeling to, you know, like produce and create and, you know, be innovative. And sometimes just hitting that pause button allows you to refuel and re-energize and come back, you know, really ready to hit the ground running again. Yeah. So you're a solo person too, huh? I'm a big time solo person. (laughs) And I've got some people in my life that totally get it and others that are like, I I don't get it at all. But I go through periods of time where, you know, I'll go like three weeks and I need a lot of like Sydney time. And then I'll have like two weeks where I'm like, Ooh, how many plans can I make? You know, in this super short (laughs) period of time. And then, you know, we kind of go through this cycle again, but I've had to learn to really trust, you know, how I'm feeling in that moment and not judge it and, um, take care of myself in that way. Um, so that I can keep showing up in the spaces and the circles and, um, that I want to be in and creating and, and, you know, doing what it is that I want to do. So I've had to learn to accept it, not judge it, embrace it and run with it all at the same time. I love it. I have, I've really loved having this conversation with you. I'm so glad that we've connected. I'm so excited about your book. I can't wait for it to come out and for people to get their hands on it. Um, But Liza, where can everyone find you? Find the F This Meditation community, your new book, and just, yeah, Yeah. learn learn more and and be part of, you know, all that it is that you're doing and creating. Yeah, thank you. Uh, And thanks again for this opportunity. This has been so fun. Fun. This I has really been so much it. fun. I, I gotta say, you have like such great energy. And the minute we got on the call, I was like, okay, this is gonna be fun. We're, yeah, we're gonna have a good time. This is gonna be a fun conversation. Me too. So I hope everyone else has enjoyed it. Me too. I hope so. <laughs> uh, so F this is it's actually spelled out E F F. That's the F this. And so you can search for our Instagram community F this meditation. Uh, on Instagram and also fthismeditation.com. Uh, as you mentioned, it's also the name of the book, which is out uh, October 22nd. The book is actually called F This Meditation, 108 
tips, tricks, and ideas for when you're feeling anxious, stressed out, or overwhelmed. So it's like when you're having those strong emotions, you can just dive into the book. And the book uh, is available on Amazon and every other online uh, bookseller or local bookstores. Um, some libraries are getting it. So anywhere that you get your books from, you can look for the book. Uh, I also do a, a really fun Friday email. I call it Five Quick Things, where it's really not salesy at all. It's uh, For me, it's a fun way to connect directly with people. And if people are interested in staying in touch, that's a really great way to do it. Uh, you can sign up for that through the F this meditation, uh, website or through my personal website, Liza Uh, and if you're trying some practices from the book, I would love to hear about how they go. Oh, perfect. I love this. I'm going to include everything in the show notes. It's going to be so easy, uh, for people to find you and to connect. And I'm excited to hear what practices people really resonate with too. I think it's going to be fun to see just the tips and the tricks, um, in action. So thank you so much again yeah, for coming you. on the podcast. This was, this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Take care.